Lauren Giglioni here this evening, from, um, who is the uh, Professor Emeritus from the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. He also has a very long and vested history of uh, newspaper journalism here in Southbridge. Many of you will probably remember him uh, as being the owner, editor, operator, and probably jack of all trades uh, when he operated the Southbridge Evening News here in town for 25 years and uh, his family grew up here. So it, there's lots of fun, uh, lots of wonderful memories have been traded this afternoon uh, talking about um, their time, uh, the uh, Mr. and Mrs. Gilioni's time here in Southbridge. And um, I think it would be um, wonderful if we could hear more about your time here in Southbridge and how it might connect to your latest publication. Um, We'd love to hear that. So thank you very much. And uh, everybody at home, thank you for watching. Thank you, Margaret. It's a very nice introduction. Maybe I can take this off so that you can hear me while I'm speaking. Um, I want to introduce my wife, Nancy Hi. Gilioni, who um, put out the paper. We did it together, this teamwork. And this is a photo of us a long time ago. Uh, from 1969 when we first got here. Uh, she was 26, I was 28, and uh, the press was 61. <laughs> um, coming into the library, we were on the cell phone with uh, Jessica, our older daughter, and she recalled uh, that Nancy uh, had sometimes had a difficult difficulty with finding places and so she told a story about how when she was three or four, we lived on uh, 13 Coolidge Avenue, renting uh, for $135 uh, a, a month, a uh, duplex from the, a Pomerino family member. And uh, Nancy would buckle Jessica into the back. She was three or four. And every week they would come to this library to get books. And one week uh, she was in the back and Nancy was driving along, and suddenly Nancy heard uh, Jessica say, Mommy, this isn't the way to the library. <laughs> and that was right. She was right. Um, so if you'd forgive me, and Margaret encouraged this, I'd like to begin tonight off topic with a love letter to a few of the people of Southbridge. I came to town, uh, as I indicated earlier, in 1969, my wife soon to follow. Uh, I was soon to be the new editor and publisher of the Southbridge Evening News, which had as new staff of four and a half, published some days as few as six pages, sold for eight cents, and struggled to break even. I was young, still in, in my 20s, with no business experience and little newsroom experience. In other words, I didn't know what I was doing. But I dreamed of putting out the best small town daily in America. The first week I was saved from myself in two ways by Arnold Goodwin, Ray Lenti, who was a big fan of the library, I might add, and other downtown merchants. I stopped publishing the canned editorials purchased from an Arizona company for $4.50 a week and started writing editorials each day about local subjects. One morning I agonized so long over the wording of one of my ever so brilliant local editorials that the paper was delivered 30 minutes late. That in turn hurt newsstand sales and reduced the number of people who read merchants' ads. Arnold Ray and other merchants explained why I needed to meet my editorial deadline. They also saved me that first week in a second way. I could not meet the paper's 19-person payroll without asking Main Street merchants to give me checks that brought their advertising accounts current. Our two daughters were born at Harrington Memorial Hospital, so I don't know. I, out there alive, but a shout out to Dr. Witter and Dr. Silverberg, uh, and they benefited from growing up and living in this caregiving community, which I like to think shaped their career choices. Both are caregivers. Laura has been an oncology nurse at Mass General Hospital for 21 years, and Jessica is a clinical psychologist in New York City. Then there were all the talented local people I wanted to thank who got out the paper including the dozens of boys and girls who delivered it. Fire Chief Albert Gregoire would host a Christmas party at the fire station for our newsies. 
The highlight of the meal, from the boisterous kids' perspective, occurred when, despite threats from adults present, spaghetti and meatballs began to fly. <laughs> and let me mention one person from the production team and one from the news team who were emblematic of the best of Southbridge. The worn composing equipment and 61-year-old press of the evening news, here Nancy is shining it up for its last run, were kept running by Leo LaFortune, a true mechanical genius who always had a cigarello lit and in his mouth. He began working at the news in 1927 at age 14, the first three weeks for free, as a printer's devil. He continued at the news later as production manager for almost 70 years, well into his 80s, as if work at the news was an inky drink from a fountain of youth. While the news sought to hire a diverse group of young reporters from everywhere, we relied on George Mosley, Fred Merklin, and Seaver Rice Here's Seaver. In their 80s and 90s, we call them our bald squad. I should talk. Uh, to pen, they penned our best red columns, all local columns. Seaver would go up and down Main Street talking with people, and he would bring in his column written longhand, and then we would type it into the composing machine. And, and uh, uh, we did these surveys. Dear Abby was the best syndicated column, but but by far, Seaver was the best red column of all. In one column, Seaver recounted how, as a loyal Republican, he helped get out the vote. In the presidential election of 1932, Franklin Roosevelt versus Herbert Hoover, Seaver received a phone call from a man named Bombi who had lost both his legs and used a wheelchair to get around. Seaver agreed to carry the wheelchair down from Bombi's second floor apartment and then carry Bombi down the stairs piggyback. Seaver drove Bombi to the polling place, carried Bombi in his wheelchair in separate trips up a long flight of stairs, and then made sure he was taken care of by election officials. In 1936, 1940, and 1944, Seaver also did his duty for the Republican Party by helping Bombi vote. Seaver ended his column about Bombi. In 1944, after he had voted and I had breathlessly carried him up the stairs to his home and deposited him in his favorite chair, he looked up at me with a grateful smile. Thank you, Mr. Rice, he said. This is four times I voted for Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could go on forever, but uh, let me tell you a bit about the trip I took around the country in 2011, following the path of a great American writer, Mark Twain, which resulted in this book, Genus Americanus, Hitting the Road in Search of America's Identity. The book, by the way, includes a chapter a section on, on our stop in Southbridge. Gonzo journalist Hunter S. Thompson wrote, old elephants limp off to the hills to die, old Americans go out to the highway and drive themselves to death. But my 2011 four, uh, 14,000 mile, three month drive around America was for me a drive to live, to take the pulse of America, to experience the education of the open road, to re research the roots of my Gilioni family, and non gilioni family members, and to interview people I'd never met and friends from decades earlier about race, sexual orientation, and other hot-button identity issues. Uh, if you go to the first slide, please. So I had two travel, traveling companions. Train, Twain wrote, there ain't no surer way to find out whether you like people or hate them than to travel with them. I really like my traveling companions. Alyssa Karras, and Dan Tham. Alyssa, who had just graduated from Northwestern University's journalism school, had rejected immediately pursuing a prestigious journalism job, the goal of many graduates, to work 78 to 80 hours a week as our trips well below minimum wage everything. Navigator, travel agent, copy editor, tech specialist, photographer, and Advil dispenser. I soon experienced the merry mischievous side of Alyssa whose motto is, everything is a good time or a good story. Halfway from Evanston to Hannibal, Missouri, uh, Mark Twain's hometown, our first night's de destination, Alyssa and I stopped at the Cahokia Mound State Historic Site in Collinsville, Illinois. The museum's information center insisted that Alyssa and I wear laminated writing permit badges on strings around our neck. I thought of a Nathaniel Hawthorne character 
the bearer of an illeg illegitimate child who was required to wear a scarlet A for adulteress on her dress. At the end of the Cahokia visit, I grumbled to a staff person about the writing permit requirement as I returned my laminated badge. Alyssa did me one better. She stole hers. <laughs> Dan, a junior who was taking the trip, he looks like he's about 14 years old here, as a one credit course, joined Alyssa and me two days into our odyssey. He was returning from internships in India and Germany that reflected his interest in reporting on the world's outliers. Credit his upbringing. He recalled his time in white bread, heavily Mormon Salt Lake City as a quadruple minority, Asian, gay, Buddhist, and vegetarian. Sextuple if you count left-handedness and color blindness. While Dan achieved in the way most journalism students wanted to achieve as a senior, he would win Northwestern's top broadcast journalism award. He also explored what it meant to be an outlier. For a course on Chicago's immigrant and multi-ethnic communities, he reported on Koreans and Tibetans, at one point finding himself in the middle of a protest for Tibetan freedom outside the Chinese embassy. Alyssa, Dan, and I interviewed 150 Americans during our trip. In the limited time we have tonight, I'm going to tell you about a few of the people we interviewed, just to give you a sense of the diversity of the people we met and their lives. I hope you'll have a question or two about the trip at the end. I'll try to answer them. So uh, here's a map of our trip. Now it takes about 3,000 miles to go directly across the country and we drove 14,000 miles. So you can see how <laughs> we didn't exactly go in a straight line to get from across the country. We started up uh, up here, near Chicago where the university campus is and we came down to Hannibal, Missouri uh, over here, uh, the hometown of uh, Mark Twain. And then we went, followed his path he quit school at 12 and became a printer's devil. And he went to New York to see the world, and then Philadelphia. And then he decided to become a riverboat pilot, so he came down through Cincinnati. And he had a, he, he was uh, a captain between St. Louis and New Orleans. And then when the Civil War occurred, the river was closed, and he, he went up to Iowa uh, and uh, worked with his brother in Muscatine and Keokuk. And then he went out west with his brother. His brother became secretary of the Navajo, Nevada Territory. And uh, he was, uh, Clemens uh, was determined to make a lot of money and he was a prospector for a while. That didn't pan out. So he became a reporter uh, in Virginia City and then in San Francisco. And then later in his life, uh, he was bankrupt and uh, Somebody who said, well, you've got to make enough money to pay back everybody, and he wanted to. So uh, he made a round-the-world uh, trip in uh, 1895. It took him a year, uh, but he started from Seattle, so we went up there, and there are other reasons that I'll explain why I wanted to go to Seattle. So um, the first person that uh, I interviewed was Connie Ritter at the Bert Mark Twain Birthplace Museum in Stoutsville, Missouri. She recalled as a child never entering the museum. No one ever told us we couldn't go inside, she said, but we knew we couldn't go inside, and now I work here. She said at the beginning, Mark Twain wasn't my cup of tea. I hated Mark Twain because of Nigger Jim. She questions Twain's use of the African-American character in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. It took me a while to understand what I understand about Huck Finn now. Ritter considers the novel an assault on racism. Ritter used her position at the museum to highlight the role of slavery in the area, which was nicknamed Little Dixie. The area had a disproportionately large number of plantations, slaves, and lynchings. In 2010, she added a slavery display to the museum's exhibit. The display showed a reproduction ball and chain, foot wide, seven and three quarter pound ball attached by a short chain to a slave's ankle that demonstrated how hard it would have been for a slave to escape. When I returned to the museum in 2015, I learned Ritter had retired in December 2014. The museum no longer employed any African Americans. Her slavery display had been taken down, supposedly only for as long as it would take to get proper permission to use the photos in the display. But in late 2017, three years after Ritter's retirement, the slavery display remained in the museum's basement. Marianne Bodine, an interpretive research specialist, talked about renovating the museum's exhibit as a 10-year project. 
if the museum displayed the slavery exhibit, she said, it would be down the line a bit, not any time soon. I telephoned Ritter at her home. She hoped the slavery display would return. I received so much positive feedback, she said. The exhibit's remo removal seemed to foreshadow in the time of Trump regression on race. I wondered whether Hannibal, this is Mark Michael Gaines, the next slide please, whether Hannibal, Mark Twain's boyhood hometown, which built itself as America's hometown, felt like home to its gay residents. The Baptist affiliated Hannibal LaGrange University refused to readmit an honors caliber student after he came out as gay on Facebook. But Michael Gaines, the 43 year old executive director of the Hannibal Arts Council, was reassuring about his life as a gay man. It's not like they're dumping people on the river. I certainly haven't experienced outward hostility or anything like that at all. He had grown up on a farm near Bethel, Missouri, a town of 108 people that was established as a religious community by German immigrants in 1844. Three or four times a year, Gaines would return to Bethel to play the piano at the Bethel Christian Church, his church since junior high. It was as much my family as my family was, he said. When church elders learned he and his partner had been living together, they took Gaines aside and told him he never again would be allowed to be part of the, quote, worship team and play the piano during services. But he joined a Bowling Green Disciples of Christ Church that welcomed his piano playing during services. The church I grew up in might change their attitude, or they may not, but it's really not of my concern now, Gaines said. Moving on. Gaines talked optimistically about cultural changes. Sometimes they take a while to trickle down to small town America, he said, but he remained committed to Hannibal. I feel loved and appreciated for who I am and for the work I do. That's pretty good for anyone. He mentioned a young man who came up to him at the party and told him how much he valued Gaines being himself in the community. Quote, my doing that made a real difference to some of his gay friends in high school, Gaines said. Made my day. The trade-off for me to move to a bigger city would be that I would actually lose a part of myself, something that most people might say I lose by staying here. Next slide, please. At the 40th anniversary mass of Dignity Chicago, a congregation that served LGBTQ Catholics, Barbara Zeman led 55 Dignity Chicago congregants in singing, for everyone born, a place at the table, to live without fear, and simply to be. Later, the 64-year-old Zeman described her path to becoming a priest, which began with a traditional Catholic upbringing. She attended Catholic schools in Cleveland and then earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Detroit Mercy. She felt a call to the priesthood. The Second Vatican Council suggested anything might be possible. Zeman thought the church soon might open the doors to women leaders and allow lay people to take ownership of our church, she said, but that failed to happen. In 2002, she learned that male bishops in Europe were ordaining women as priests. But they were doing so in secret, she said, because if their identities became known, they would be removed from their duties and put under house arrest by the Vatican. In 2008, the Vatican decreed excommunication for any woman who sought ordination. Nevertheless, that year a female bishop of Roman Catholic women priests, an organization not sanctioned by the Catholic Church, ordained Zeman in Chicago. Hundreds of Catholic women have been similarly ordained worldwide since then. In response, the Vatican categorized ordination of women as crimes against the church so serious that they ranked with priest sexual abuse of children. I'm going to be who I am, Zeman said. In 2018, 60% of U.S. Catholics felt women should be permitted to be priests, but Zeman doubted the Catholic Church would change its position on the role of women priests. These guys are playing hardball, she said. It's about power, not about Jesus. Next slide, please. We visited Evanston, Chicago sh suburb where we started our trip to interview Alicia Dalla, a student at Northwestern. She grew up in San Antonio, she said, very all-American. Girl Scout, National Honor Society member, student newspaper co-editor, summa cum laude graduate of Ronald Reagan High School. In November 2010, during her junior year at Northwestern, she received a notice from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security that said she was, quote, not a citizen or national of the United States, unquote, and faced the possibility of deportation for overstaying a Canadian visa. I was in shock, Dallas said. I grew up completely unaware of my legal status. 
Of Indian and Tanzanian descent, Dalla was born in Canada, but in October 1996, when she was six years old, financial struggles led my parents to move the family to San Antonio, she said. She had not done anything wrong. All I did was listen to my parents, and they said, we're moving to Texas. I contacted Dalla in 2019. She had been one of the first young undocumented immigrants in the country to receive a conditional work permit and deferred action status under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals DACA program. That Obama administration initiative lifted her fear of being deported for at least two years. A provision of the 2000 Legal and Immigration Family Equity Act life allowed her, unlike most DACA recipients, to apply and be approved for a green card. But the cap on the number of green cards available to Canadians was so low that she could not be certain that she would ever be allowed to permanently live and work in the United States. Dahl had made the most of her years since her 2012 graduated from graduation from Northwestern. She had bought a home and car, paid off more than $114,000 in student loans, started a small business that helped job-seeking Americans and immigrants write resumes and cover letters, and paid her share of federal and state taxes. The DACA program allowed her, she said, to give back to the country I consider home. She was working in Washington, D.C. as press director for FWD Dot US, an organization founded to keep the United States competitive in a global economy by in part achieving immigration reform and protecting from deportation the estimated 690,000 young immigrants known as dreamers. What would she do if the United States deported her to Canada? I really don't have a plan, she said, except to remain in America. That was her plan, her home country. Next slide, please. <coughs> Many Americans viewed Muslims' religion, Islam, as an anti-Christian faith, fraudulent, destructive, and evil. In Innocence Abroad, a young, ignorant Mark Twain portrayed Muslim leaders as bloodthirsty savages, on a par with American Indians, whom Twain also denounced as subhuman. He wrote, Muslims, quote, natural instincts do not permit them to be moral. That perception of Muslims and of Islam was reinforced by the coordinated terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Dan, Alyssa, and I talked about this with Ingrid Matson, whom the New York Times labeled perhaps the most noticed figure among American Muslim women. She directed Hartford Seminary's McDonald Center for the Study of Islam and Christian-Muslim Relations. She also headed the Islamic, Islamic Society of North America. Matson grew up Roman Catholic and attended a Catholic girls' high school, but she stopped going to mass at 16. A precocious unbeliever I was, and identified as an agnostic. Impressed by a dignity and generosity of spirit of West African Muslims she met while studying in Paris, she started reading the Quran, converted to Islam, and earned a PhD in Islamic studies. Matson stressed the importance of treating Muslims as individuals, and recognized that Islam is not anti-Western or anti-modernity. The vast majority of America's five to eight million Muslims, a quarter of whom are African Americans, integrated themselves into U.S. culture. Some adopted anglicized names, married non-Muslims, and thoroughly assimilated. Others proudly held on to distinctive Muslim names, dress, and traditions, still pursuing the American dream. They saw the United States, by and large, as a multicultural democracy that, while often flawed, valued law and liberty, including religious freedom. Matson struck me as a modern Muslim woman who was as progressive as a Muslim woman can be and still show respect for traditional aspects of Islam's culture. She sided with the majority of Muslims who felt that the Imam, the officiating priest of a mosque, should be a male if called on to lead prayer for a congregation of men and women. She wore a headscarf and covered all but her hands and face, which she viewed as an act of equality and empowerment that helped free her from being judged on her appearance. But she kept her surname when she married. She mowed the family's lawn while her husband served as primary family cook. She shared equally with her husband in raising their two children. American Muslims, Matson said, have had an unfair burden placed on them since 9-11. They are expected to eradicate radical Muslim terrorists and their sympathizers. We would love to. But we are not in control of those people, Matson said. 
These horrible people are terrorizing everyone. More Muslims have been killed by ISIS than non-Muslims. Muslims are like other people in that we have our good guys and our bad guys. Don't judge Muslim people by the worst of them. Next slide, please. In Chicago, Kansas, and San Francisco, we interviewed Native Americans whose stories are often ignored or even worse, erased. Indigenous people had been in the San Francisco area for more than 10,000 years. The cemetery of Mission Dolores, founded by Spanish priests in 1776, reminded us that in an earlier era, the Spanish missions not only forced conversion to obliterate the local Indians' names, languages, and culture, but also helped decimate the area's North Native Americans. Vincent Medina, a 27-year-old assistant curator at the mission and a member of the Chocheno Ohlene community, said almost 6,000 Native Americans constituted the largest group buried there. Spanish priests such as Junipero Serra, founder of the California missions, who was given sainthood by Pope Francis in 2015, saw the missions as utopian Christian communities to help the Indians and save their souls. In reality, the missions were, Medina said, horrible places similar to concentration camps. Once baptized, Indians were held against their will. They were treated as slaves, their land taken, their labor exploited. A detachment of soldiers shackled and whipped those who tried to flee. Unmarried Indian women were forced to work as spinners and weavers when they were not being driven into the mission for mass or lessons in church doctrine. By 1843, the mission's total Indian population of at least 1,000 had been reduced to eight aged starlings. starvelings. That experience drove Medina to work at Mission Dolores, where he offered uh, Indian perspective on the history of the missions. Medina also committed to a larger challenge to change the way the story of the missionary missions was told and taught throughout, throughout California in a fourth grade unit on the missions. I took that, uh, that lesson when I was in the fourth grade in the California public school, by the way. Mission, uh, Medina also committed to a larger challenge to change the way the story of the missions was told and taught throughout California uh, in, in the fourth grade unit on the missions. Some mission curators resisted, but he helped the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center develop a website of Indian, about Indian opposition to the missions. He worked at Heyday, the publisher of two books about California Indians, as an outreach coordinator. He is determined, he said, to make concrete change happen. Next slide, please. One evening in San Francisco, our parked van fell victim to smash and grabbers. They escaped with our video camera, two laptop computers, and Alyssa's two suitcases. The loss of irreplaceable video interviews and photos hit us hard. The story got better the next morning. Someone named Kimberly Kills tweeted Alyssa and asked where she was. Alyssa replied, San Francisco, and learned that Kills had found one of her suitcases after midnight on a sidewalk in Oakland, about 10 miles from San Francisco. In arranging for us to meet Kills at a Starbucks in Oakland to pick up her bag, Alyssa said, I think she's a porn star. <laughs> Alyssa appeared to be right. KimKills.com called Kills, quote, one of the hottest natural transsexual porn stars on this planet, unquote. Kills described herself as a 28-year-old transgender male-to-female model who performed in adult films. When we arrived at the Oakland Starbucks, Kills was drinking a cup of coffee and typing on her laptop. She could have been a university student attracted to Oakland by a punk scene. She displayed a heart tattoo on her neck and an angel tattoo on her shoulder. Her black t-shirt carried a catchphrase from No Way Back, a 1976 black exploitation film quote, never trust a woman with her clothes off. Kills posed for a photo with Lissa. Here it is. They looked like sisters. For us, Kills was a sister of kindness. She said she had been out of work and was in need of clothes when she came across Alyssa's suitcase on the street. But Kills found Alyssa's business card in the suitcase and tweeted her, I just thought it was the right thing to do, Kills said. Kills had something personal to say about the identity issues that were the focus of our trip. She labored, labeled her sexual orientation as polyamorous bisexual. The child of parents who divorced when she was about two, Kills grew up in a mil as a military brat who moved every two or so years from town to town across America. When Alyssa checked the contents of her suitcase 
The only missing item of note was a biography of Mark Twain. No doubt our erudite smash and grabbers wanted to read about Twain's time in San Francisco, which he called the most cordial and sociable city, perhaps to learn how they could be even more hospitable to out-of-towners. Next slide, please. I wanted our trip to end in Seattle because my Giglione great-grandparents, after coming from northern Italian villages to New York City in the 1870s, moved to Seattle around 1900. One purpose of our trip was to explore the identity of immigrants, especially Italian-Americans. They were exploited as strike bakers in U.S. coal fields, lynched by Louisiana mobs in the 1890s and regularly vilified by nativist bigots as biologically inferior an anarchists. In 1906, Washington Post editorial said, 90% of arriving Italians were, quote, the degenerate spawn of Asiatic hordes traveling to America to cut throats, throw dynamite, and conduct labor, conduct labor riots and assassinations. I focused on my own family, beginning with the arrival from Punta Decimo, Italy, in 1872 with my great-grandfather Angelo Francisco Giglione, a barely literate indentured pasta maker shown here during his New York City days. I still have his indenture papers uh, and he worked for three years, something like, you know, 17 cents, uh, I can't remember, a day, an hour, <laughs> but it wasn't a lot. Uh, and uh, also they took uh, a dollar a week out of his pay case he fled, they, that he wouldn't get uh, that pay, but at the end of the three years he got that money. Um, while eventually he would run his own, own company, A.F. Giglione and Sons, in New York and then in Seattle, Maria Strada Giglione, a four foot, 10 inch, 95 pound tyrant, <laughs> ran him and the rest of the family. There she is. Her Sunday dinner meant not only fine food, but also family right. Everyone had to attend. Even when family dinners were held at her son's homes in Seattle, she dictated what was to be served. Maria hung on to the old world. Her Ligurian dialect was incomprehensible to a grandchild who had learned Italian. Those who disobeyed Maria were called, I'm translating, turnip head or idiot. Maria's superstitions ruled. We couldn't have 13 at the dinner table, and we always had 13 in the family, Mabel Lucas, a granddaughter, said. She didn't want a handkerchief as a gift. A handkerchief meant crying, or sharp things, because they would cut a friendship. Maria saw perfection in everything. Later in life, she rinsed her hair in kerosene, which whitened it. Even her hair had to be perfect. Sometimes the search for perfection resulted in rudeness. When she visited her children's families, Upon sitting down to eat, she would pick up the plate and rub her finger across it to make sure there was no grease on it. When cooking dinner at home, she insisted on the freshest of vegetables and fruits from her garden, everything planted by the moon, or from Seattle's Pike Street Market, founded by an Italian immigrant. Maria ordered the Pike Street Market vendors to give her their best or else. She required each ravioli of finely chopped brains for moisture, veal, pork, chicken, eggs, Parmesan cheese, and spinach to be, to be made thin and tiny, no larger than a postage stamp. Traditional values, honor, cleanliness, thrift, constituted a holy trinity in Maria Giglione's home. To ensure a fingerprint-free dining room table, the children were not permitted to touch the table. Their chairs sat on oil cloths. Each day, one room was cleaned thoroughly, the furniture hauled outside, the paintings and mirrors taken off the walls, the curtains removed and washed. Maria's thrift bordered on miserliness. Her husband, who was expected to bring her every cent of his pay each week, once returned home with only five dollars. I bought a few rounds for the boys at work, he said. Maria exploded, okay, if you're going to drink it up, I'm going to burn it up, she screamed, tossing the five dollar bill on a parlor stove. As much as I revered the entrepreneurial spirit of my great-grandfather and, uh, and the values of my great-grandmother, I especially admired the contributions of their son, Dr. August J. Giglione, who cared for Seattle's Italian-Americans from 1905 until his death in 1949 and served them as Italian counsel for the Pacific Northwest from 1907 to 1914. And 
here he is in the center, guy with a big nose. In the... um, when the Black Hand, a criminal and syndicate formed by Italian immigrants, tried to extort money from other Italian immigrants, Dr. Giglioni aided police in breaking up the plot. For a time, he traveled with a bodyguard and carried a gun in his car. One night, he put his Pope Hartford in his garage. He, his wife, and their two children retired for the evening. Shortly after midnight, the garage exploded. The Seattle Daily Times carried front page photos. The headline shouted, dynamite outrage perpetrated against Italian consular agent Giglioni. Under the headline of The Shame of Seattle, the Post Intelligencer editorialized about the corrupt police, the partnership between the police chief and criminal classes, and the chief's unwillingness to protect Dr. Giglioni and his family. When Dr. Giglioni wasn't dealing with corrupt police, he helped meet the medical needs of impoverished Italian immigrants. His patients were primarily truck gardeners and laborers from southern and central Italy who lived in neighborhoods with nicknames like Garlic Gulch. Dr. Giglioni conveniently forgot to charge patients who lacked the money to pay. When the Seattle Times reader disparaged Italian, Chinese, and Japanese immigrants in 1910, Dr. Giglioni attacked the reader's ignorance and misinformation. He defended immigrants' patriotism and dis dismissed the reader's call for immigration restrictions as amounting to, quote, air bubbles. In response to the reader's claim that Italians were violent criminals, Dr. Giglioni cited a study of Italians in America that concluded, quote, generally speaking, they are gentle drudges, honest, faithful, and inoffensive. He foresaw an America enriched and enlivened by generations to come by its immigrants, by people of different races, ethnicities, religions, and visions of what life in the United States could be. Dr. Giglioni's defense of immigrants reminded me of one of the things that I love about Southbridge and to tried to celebrate when I put out the, e the evening news, the community's diversity. We wrote a series of articles that went on forever about each of the area's immigrant communities. And we published a book, The Ethnic Stew, which is over here. This is on the 60th anniversary of the paper. And it had chapters for representing 17 cultures from Albanian to Laotian to, to Polish, Puerto Rican to Vietnamese. Uh, and then drawings of you know, how you cook the, the, men, the, the menu that uh, uh, the, the family uh, shown here would, was offering. It was really nicely done. Roy Gunter did it. And there was a photo of, uh, of the people, uh, you know, uh, Polish Christmas Eve supper. Ludmilla Roskowski, who produces pierogi to the hundreds of homes and by the thousands for Southridge's Polish picnics. Anyway, I love that <coughs> aspect of Southbridge. So not surprisingly, when Alyssa, Dan, and I stopped off in Southbridge during our trip, we made sure to visit a restaurant that represented the area's ethnic cooking and generous spirit. I'm not going to tell you about all our time in Southbridge. After all, I want you to buy the book, which is available hand-in-hand -hand on Amazon or through such local bookstores as Book Lovers Gourmet and Webster. In 1969, when I first arrived in town, before retiring to my $18 a week boarding house room, I still remember Miss Redhead. I often ate dinner at Mario's, then a tiny Main Street restaurant down by AO. Because he was feeling sorry for an evening news novice who clearly knew nothing about Southbridge, Mario Piccioni, the restaurant's owner, insisted on buying me dinner during my first week in town. When later he read I had become the paper's owner, he sent me a small celebratory orange tree, an act of kindness I will never forget. So I wanted to see Mario during my return to Southbridge. Ron Tremblay, Jean Ashton, and Mark Ashton, managers crucial to the success of the evening news during my time there, joined Dan, Alyssa, and me for lunch at Mario's. We swapped stories, some stories I was quite willing to forget about the time I challenged the sports editor, the Southbridge librarian Barbara King, and insurance agent Al Bouvier to a mile race at the high school track and wound up losing my knees full of cinders. 
about my self-indulgent 106-part editorial series on nuclear arms issues, about my equally self-indulgent photo-filled editorial on the Lamaze-style birth of our first daughter, in which I used the royal we, as if Jessica were coming out of my womb as well as Nancy's. <laughs> Each lo local ethnic family, I learned soon after joining the Evening News, contributed to the community in its own way. Mar Mario showed us a 1991 plaque that celebrated the 100th anniversary of the arrival in Southbridge of the first Italian immigrants. The plaque applauded the, quote, thrifty, hardworking people who quickly learned the English language and contributed to this community as masons, contractors, craftsmen, and industrialists, unquote. Perhaps this is a good place to end with Dr. Giglioni's and Southbridge's celebration of immigrants. I can't resist contrasting the Trump administration's pursuit of the destruction of immigration in America and to invite your questions and comments about what I've had to say this evening. And thank you very much for inviting me here. It's been a joy. Thank you.